project that I have just recently joined, Pocket Locker, as it is called. This is actually kind of a genesis of some guys at Bell Labs, along with Anna and Jeff here locally, and I am kind of right now in Waterboy, kind of trying to feel my way into the project on this. What is Pocket Locker? What's its motivation? How can it help people in the long run? Well, the purpose of Pocket Locker, in a nutshell, it's a distributed file storage system. There are a lot of these that are out there. Let's actually talk about this. People have mobile devices, and mobile devices are good for a lot of things. They're also not good for a lot of things. As you know, with mobile devices, well, you always have it with you, and it becomes very easy to generate a lot of content, take pictures, take sound clips, what have you. So there's a lot of this content that's being generated, but there's some problems with this content, too. Specifically, most mobile devices have no backup strategy whatsoever. Plus, let's face it, they're teensy tiny compared to users' desktops, servers, what have you. So we have to address some of these problems. If you think about it, You've got things like 3G, it's going to cost money. Uh, you think about it, again, there are no real, if, if you will, backups, if you will, programs that people actually have installed on their, if you will, mobile devices. How can Pocket Locker actually address these? Well, we can go in the direction of something like Dropbox. If you think about it, there are a lot of cloud storage solutions that are already out there. And they do a world of good, but they do have their own problems. Specifically, if you look at something like a Dropbox type solution, Number one, even though it's going to be bigger in terms of capacity than what you have on your Android phone, it's still going to be probably somewhat limited. If you want additional storage, you're probably going to have to pay. So that's one of the biggest limitations on that. The other thing, if you think about it, is you've got a problem in terms of cost, uh, like with devices. You're going to have a problem with, let's say, transferring data each time you transfer data off of a mobile phone. That in itself is going to cost money. And solutions like Dropbox are typically not going to be sensitive to these needs. If you do kind of like a standard uh, synchronous backup solution, well, it's going to back up really whenever it feels like. In other words, you may be on battery, you may be on 3G, and it's going to try to transfer you know, a 10 gigabyte movie file, and you'll get a very nice cellular bill in the mail the next month. So how can we kind of try to take advantage of cloud storage, but at the same time, minimize costs in terms of both time and money to the end user? Well, let's take a look at the question. Um, you know, I, I think some of those, you know, uh, things allow you to specify whether or not you wanted to do the synchronization uh, under Wi-Fi only or, or, or we can have cellular. I, I think, you know. I should not make a blanket statement on that, but you're right. right. I mean, in other words, maybe let, let me back off and say we want a solution that most definitely is aware of these limitations. Sure. Okay, so perhaps I should qualify that. Okay. Yes. So that will solve that problem. So if, if, we, if we do solve that problem of, you know, of using cellular, a lot of cellular data and only think, thinks when the device is, is having Wi-Fi, then the only problem left is the limited storage on the smartphone? That's but, one of the things. But okay. even that, it's not a big problem. You can select it you know, things that you wanted to download it to your smartphone, right? Even if your Dropbox, you know, has many, many folders, you only need to select a certain subset of that to, to sync, to download on your smartphone. I guess what we like to do is have available to users even more storage. Like, let's say your Dropbox is currently 20 gigabytes or what have you, mm -hmm. okay? My point is, if you look at, let's say, a typical user's desktop, it probably has a two terabyte hard drive in it. In other words, how can we kind of take advantage of this untapped capacity that most users do have? Okay. So I would say definitely cloud storage is most definitely growing. At the same time, uncloud, if you will, land storage is still going to be, if you will, several magnitudes bigger on this. This is the old trade-off between high availability, costly network storage, and slightly less available but more voluminous local storage on this. And we're actually going to get into some of the design trade-offs as we go along today. The other thing that I suggest that we're going to try to work into here is can we, well, try to improve some redundancy here? Because one of the problems with, let's say, a user's two terabyte hard drive is they're probably going to back that up even less than they would a phone, which is to say next to never on this. So how can we take advantage of the fact that maybe a user has a desktop and a laptop and maybe is also willing to share files with another user's desktop on that, plus there might be one of these 
Gucci Coochie NAS things that you buy at Best Buy and you plug into your uh, home LAN. And how can you kind of take advantage of the existence of these to implement, if you will, kind of a quasi JBOD raid on them? So there's actually some of, uh, actually, well, basically a lot of planning is going into can we achieve more space for, uh, I'm sorry, more volume for storage and also, if you will, more redundancy. Okay. Let's actually take a look at the system parts and perhaps the graphical elucidation. I have to apologize. I'm a poor student. I could not afford the color version of PowerPoint. Let's take a look and see what we actually have. On the top here are the clients themselves. And typically, it's going to be one person to start off with. Okay, one person with, let's say, an Android phone. This is not meant as a sharing system. This is not meant as a replacement for BitTorrent. So kind of mentally block off this mobile client number two for the moment here. Okay, client number one is wants to take advantage of these, we call them storage lockers down at the bottom here. In other words, storage locker one might be the client's home computer. Storage locker two might be the client's home desktop. Storage locker three might be the client's work desktop. Okay, so how can the client take advantage of these? Well, first off, we can't really assume connectivity directly between the mobile client and the storage lockers because, again, when I say a home LAN, uh, most users would not even have the faintest clue as to how to open up a port or do port redirection on that. So we're not going to assume that that is something that's really viable as a system strategy on this. So how can we get a light around this? Well, we do have built in two always-on parts in the cloud. Number one is, yes, cloud storage. Wait a minute, I just got you saying that we're not going to use cloud storage. Well, I lie. Okay, we're going to use it as kind of temporary, as a point of last resort, and also a relay. We'll explain that in just a sec. And the big thing, server orchestrator. This thing, it's a server, it orchestrates, if you will, which parts get shuffled among all these things, in other words, what the backup strategy is. It doesn't actually store anything. But as you can see, basically all of the mobile devices are constantly tapping into cloud storage and the server, and all of the storage devices are also tapping into the cloud storage and server. And that is going to allow us to get around problems like, if you will, state hall packet inspection. So that way, this answers the question, how can I port a file onto my home desktop? Well, we're going to do a relay, such as we talked about in 589 with, if you will, um, what's that video service that people use again? Um, anyway, whatever it is, um, Skype. Okay. Um, basically, we're going to use that as kind of a relay, if you will, port files from one blocked off land to another blocked off land. So that's one of the major reasons we have this cloud storage. Okay? On client structure. Graphical elucidation Correct. right again, and if you will, the ASCII Question. elucidation. Question. Yes. So how again, I didn't quite understand if it's not routable, what are you doing? Uh, okay. If we have a problem with connectivity, and again, if I can go back like right here. In other words, if we have a problem between a mobile device and let's say sure. the user's home computer, let's say the computer maybe isn't even at home and can't connect over Wi-Fi or what have you, or just what we're going to do is, okay, the mobile client, we'll talk about this in more detail in just a sec. Let's say a person takes a picture, okay? No, no, so let me specify my question. Yes. So I think uh, the, uh, the analogy to Skype was what was missing. So you, that needs something to be running on the uh, storage locker side. Yes, yes, okay. yes, Th that this is exactly right. We're talking to the cloud storage and the orchestrator. Correct. This okay. is a relay of information, this is a relay of data. And in your architecture, these two are somehow central, just like Skype. I have some master servers that anybody can go talk to, so it's not private anymore. So because the mobile client and the storage locker belong to me, but this central stuff is run by you guys. Well, the cloud storage, we can use like a private Dropbox account or something, but you're sure. right, in one sense, I don't think that we can assume that end users can set up and maintain the orchestrator, the server. That is correct. So I guess that would be something that will kind of in perpetuity have to build be something that users will have to trust us as system sure. admin admins. So then you, you lose the security part that you mentioned in the previous slide. Well, we lose the security in the sense <laughs> that they don't trust us, I guess, to the same extent that I mean, all you, of us. If you ask them to trust you, then it's not a security. 
Well, I mean, I think to a, to a certain extent, we all, all have to have trust in the sense that you're trusting that I don't have a master key to your apartment and I don't enter it when you're not there and, let's say, port the hard drive off. So to a certain extent, there's always going to be some, if you will, trust, if you will. Oh, no, I mean, so if you're, I, I, if you're trying to, I, when you write a paper, if you, if you mention security, then someone will mention this. Right. If you, I mean, you can say that like, it's kind of secure to me and here, but if you write something, if you write security in your paper, then you wanna be like that's a, it's not secure. So you, you wanna. It is not secure yeah. in the sense that yeah. not all the parts are contained under the user's physical control. That is certainly true. I mean, I should also say, too, I've made kind of an implicit assumption right here. I mentioned earlier that Storage Locker 3 is, let's say, the user's workplace desktop, and we want to take advantage of that. Well, that is also something that is kind of, there's already an implicit trust right there, that the user uh, is using corporate resources, that the corporate admin is not snooping, yada, yada, yada on that. So yes, you are right. There are assumptions about yeah, security we have to make. That is correct. Yes. So to extend that question, if I'm running something on the locker side, there's no reason why I can't tunnel through the local network. Like they really, I'm not sure architecturally there's a requirement for the server, is what I'm saying. So if I'm running something continuously on the client and on the locker side, mm -hmm. then, and given the way our lives are structured, I, I might have something at home, something at work, and Likely I'll have two or three lockers, like I have a set, set number of lockers. It's not like that's going to change very dynamically. You can always create some sort of a problem. Like, uh, oh, certainly you can. Again, certainly given enough network know-how, we can, let's say, let's say create a VPN or what have you. Uh, I, but the thing is, I guess this is one of the flies in the ointment that we still need to deal with at some level. And that is, let's say, a, typ a user's typical home LAN is going to have a router that will block incoming connections. No, but that's what I'm saying. I create a tunnel. So typically the way you get around that is you create a tunnel. Yes, but someone has to be able to accept an incoming connection at one of the two ends. Right. Okay. And if neither of the two ends accept an incoming connection, that necessitates a third sure. middleman to serve as a relay. Now, that's, again, I'm sorry. So that's actually not entirely the case. So there's a... I don't know if you heard of a uh, hole punching in that uh, Skype and all the P2P solutions. Right. When the clients are behind the app, then they use that technique to actually open the open the port. The yeah, basically it's But they, those are outgoing uh, connections. They do both, incoming and outgoing. But you're not going to be able to, unless you twiddle around with the router settings. No, no. that's the case. And that, that, that is the case. It's, it's called hole punching. Hole punching mm -hmm. requires you first to have an in somewhere in the intermediate node to go out first. This is the well, action yes. of the hole punching. Once right. you punch the hole there, and then you can come in. Right, 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 right. right. But no, so but that's what I'm saying. I started by saying there are only so many places we have these lockers. So I say my mobile client, I go home once and I say, right. I'm running the service on my uh, locker side. I run it the first time and I, I say, here, you connect to this guy, right? So once. Yeah. And the whole response. Uh -huh. And from that point on, you can do whatever, potentially. Well, there, yeah, I mean, they're obviously neglecting like timeouts and things like that. I'm just saying that at one of the two ends, there has to be some way of accepting an incoming connection. So, and if you don't have that, again, you're going to need some sort of a relay on it. So, um, I guess, I guess what I was saying is that that is already possible by hole punching. But what why, I'm saying, why can't you just use that? Because I configured a number of routers on this, and you have to either explicitly open up a port and forward it. So, so you probably are misunderstanding what I'm okay, saying. Okay. It's not necessary. That's what I'm saying. Which one is not necessary? Oh, the, so you have a server. Router the server right. Yeah. Then you can just connect to the server. Oh, that's what. Yes, that's yeah. what I'm saying. And then whole punch. They are both. And then the one client one can talk to storage locker one. Yes. After punching the hole. Correct. So you can eliminate the cloud storage completely because you're now talking directly to lockers. Right. Okay. In other words, if they have in some way, well, wait a minute. Okay. If if there's some way that mobile client can communicate directly to the storage locker, but but the the, the storage locker 
See, that server, my understanding of the, the server that, that uh, he's talking about is just a, a signaling sort of intermediate node that, that, that allowed you to do the whole crunching. It, it is not a physical entity that has a network connectivity. I don't know that that's hard. Well, they do have both of these. I don't know how, how it works, but yeah. At the middle layer, those are always on that do have accepting incoming connections on this. Right, right. And so you're basically telling, saying that server is somewhere <coughs> and anyone can connect to the server. Right? Correct, yes. So what I'm saying is, just like what Skype does, mm -hmm. you can use the server to uh, let mobile client one talk to other lockers yes. directly. Okay. Um, I will say I, I'm not. The, the problem is these lockers are down external disk. They don't have even you know the operating systems are they? sitting on there. But there's oh, something really? actually running on it, isn't there? Is there? It could be attached. something like a Windows desktop or something like yeah, that. But so the real problem is like the, if you will, the the user's router. Okay, one of those one hundred dollar Best Buy specials or something like that. Oh, so you, yeah. okay, so those they, they are attached to a computer. Right. The lockers are are yeah. not just the external disk. They could be also they could I mean, be an external, but you could also like it. It could be like a desktop. Right. They cannot be just this. Oh, okay. So my uh, my yeah. bad. I I thought they uh, that that way you have to have a server. But yes, if if this this is an entity itself. Once the hole is punched, then you can have mobile client talk to the storage locker directly. But you need something to get it punched in the first place. So that's the server. server. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Yes. So, so again, that's how sky works basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. So and they eliminate the middleman once it's punched. Right. It. Okay. Right. That I am not familiar with. I'll definitely have to look into that. Uh, but I'm saying is, in some way or form, I do know that you need something to, if you will get around the problem of accepting incoming connections when you have a firewall that is, if you will, blocking all incoming connections by default from square one. So anyway, that is one of the reasons that we have a storage cloud. The other thing is uh, you can also see, since these are maybe a user's home desktop, it may not always be on. Okay, It might have crashed or what have you. There may be some storage problems. So we can also use this storage locker as to a certain, I'm sorry, the storage cloud as a guaranteed always on repository on this. So, in other words, if we're needing to back up a file quickly, or let's say retrieve a file, we can always use that as kind of a fail-safe. Okay, let's actually take a look at uh, what goes on in terms of, oh, hold on. Um, oh yes, okay, on client side. This is what I was about to get to earlier. What's actually going on on the Android phone itself? And talk about some of the architecture of that. Basically what we have here is, and mobile application that installs on, a, let's say, a person's Android phone, and that's this gizmo right here. And standard application, what it serves as is a file system redirector between, if you will, pocket locket aware applications and, if you will, two types of file systems, the Android local file system and the pocket locker storage cloud on that. The whole point is, if you are using a pocket locker aware application, you want to be able to take advantage of this huge storage capacity in the cloud here. And you want, ideally want to be able to take advantage of it as seamlessly as possible on that. Okay. Now, there are going to be some applications that are not aware of pocket locker. And the way we're designing the system right now is, in short, applications that generate content, such as cameras, do not have to be aware or modified for pocket locker. They can simply create a photo, a JPEG, and dump it right on the local file system. The hitch is we need to make sure that the pocket locker client itself is constantly monitoring, if you will, let's say, oops, there's a new photograph. It needs to be taken care of, addressed, backed up. Hence the connection pocket locker client is always monitoring the local file system. And there's a new file. It's got to be ported off to the file, if you will, the storage cloud. Because later on, that file might be zapped from the local file system. Or maybe the user wants to just get at a file that simply was never on the local file system in the first place. Hence, okay, we can kind of redirect to the pocket locker client to the storage cloud. Now, let me anticipate one question right here because it involves what, what level of network indirection we're using. Why didn't we simply modify the Android platform itself? I think actually in the long run that is certainly the much cleaner way to go. And that was kind of my first question when I joined the team itself, like, why aren't you doing this? 
apparently there was quite the holy war going on as to which direction to go in in the first place. Uh, what it boiled down to was, for now what we want is a proof of concept, and we want to be able to roll out a system that is deployable through the Android marketplace. And simply put, once you start mucking around with the Android platform, you're not going to be able to do that. Longer run, I think that's probably the way to go on this. It comes up to the design trade-off that the applications have to be aware of the pocket locker system. Okay, if we modified the platform, obviously things would be a lot more seamless. Questions on this so far? There's a question of how you use the network. Um, like the pocket logger client is now seamlessly sending things to the network, or does it also send it to the local storage? It actually is yes and no. Actually, good question. It does use local storage. We're going to be talking about this in just a sec here. But when a user generates a file, Again, one of the applications of Pocket Locker is not simply expanded storage, but redundancy. What it does is it basically takes the file, breaks it up into chunks, and these are redundant chunks that it can then distribute among a whole bunch of devices. It deliberately tries to keep at least a local copy, at least in the short run, for availability purposes. In other words, just because there's a new photograph here, it doesn't immediately zap it off the local phone. Does that answer your question on that? Yeah, so I mean, well, uh it's not quite an initial question. So essentially what your local file system now is is a cache, right? Yes. So you can use it and you can come up with some fancy caching algorithm, say least recently used, whatever, correct. and the rest I ship off. Ship off. That right. is correct. But yes. the other question is how do you use your network? So I might be on Wi-Fi, I might be on 3G. Uh, this has bandwidth implications and price implications, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming you're coming to those. Okay. Exactly right. right. Yeah, okay. actually a good analogy is that, you know, treat the uh, local storage on the phone as a first level cache. Yeah. And this cloud storage will be a second level, you know, big, huge cache. Only and here then, the and, delays are much higher. Yeah, 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 right. right. But, but logically that's the case. And right. then, then, then the actual storage that we talk about at home, those are sort of like the analogy to the disk, right, if you will. So you have like two <coughs> level of caches in a big disk. But, but, but uh, you know, I think Kothik is right that there's a lot of interesting caching strategy that you could, could study given the differences in the bandwidth and, and, and all that, you know, different interfaces, you right. have to worry about cellular data and charges. Latency. So, yeah, I and latency. Yeah, and all that issue. 90s, there's, there's yeah, file systems really caching. In, interesting bandwidth. research issues, not right. just the system implementation issues. Right. So the second point I had was uh, breaking uh, the files into these chunks. It reminds me very much of Freenet. Have you seen Freenet? I have not. So Freenet does both secure anonymous storage, but also basically runs on this concept of I have. So I throw my file into this peer-to-peer -peer network, and I don't know where it is. And that's one of the anonymity. Like, nobody is blamed for sharing illegal copyrighted media. But basically, it breaks it up into chunks, and you can get these chunks from different places. And now, it provides redundancy and anonymity at the same time. In your case, I think you're focusing on the redundancy. And you might want to look at, they had a few papers I, I guess in the early 2000s. <coughs> okay, yeah, like, what was the name of that again? Freenet. Freenet. Yeah. Okay. The peer-to-peer -peer network that is, yeah, completely peer-to-peer -peer anonymizes stuff. And Those you chunks. don't know what you're storing, but whenever you want a movie, for example. Those chunks are encrypted, right? So Those chunks are also encrypted. Yeah, as long as you get the K out of the N chunks, you right. can, you know. Yeah, so there's all these the strategies for how you split that, that That will address your security concern that, that you want. Actually, you're exactly right. I mean, one nice way, if you have fewer than the K chunks, you cannot reconstitute the file. You, even, you can even skip the encryption step if so you want I, to. One very cute idea is to use all the DHT work. So distributed hash tables. People spent, I think, 10 years working on how you hash. I have the storage. I want to split it up across multiple machines, multiple network entities. And the question is, how do I go about doing this in some reasonable way such that it, there is load balancing and properties of this kind? So uh, you can recast what you're doing uh, or, and basically use hash to sort of figure out what you store locally, what you store remotely, <coughs> depending on the actual pattern. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. In the long run, I think this does have big implications, and you can really get into fine-tuning. Right now, we're trying to get, if you will, a proof of concept right. off the ground with, with like a couple levels. But you're right. I mean, you can think of, again, 
the local phone as being the quickest level of cash on that. Right. I mean, ultimately, what this really devolves into is we're trying to offload resources from the mobile device to the cloud to a certain extent. And we're just kind of expanding the definition of cloud from the standard Dropbox to kind of include, if you will, users, let's say home computers and whatnot. I mean, you can even say in the long run, I wouldn't be surprised if you're going to see papers kind of uh, smelling around with can we offload CPU cycles. Obviously much more complicated, but it's kind of the same idea. Anyway, let's talk about maybe this might address some of the, your questions about in terms of how we actually go about doing this. Okay, in terms of backup strategy number one here, we try to impose a minimum threshold. Those we're not even going to bother backing up a file for, let's say, an hour or so. I mean, in one sense, this is kind of bad because isn't the whole idea to kind of provide backup as soon as possible? Well, trade-off number one is, since it's a mobile device and we may have cost and bandwidth issues on this, we're going to deliberately hold back for a little bit because typically users, if they're going to do edits or changes to files, it's probably going to happen fairly quickly. So let's just hold back a little bit before we actually start the backup process. Then we start the backup process. Okay, use erasure coding, break it into chunks, yada, yada, yada on this. This is actually done on the phone side. Okay, uh, research was done before I joined that it actually does not chew up that much energy on it. Now, just because the chunks have been formed, it still doesn't mean we're ready to port them off to those storage lockers that we can hear that. Just lock. Uh, come on. Sorry about that. There we go. Yes. Just because we broke up, if you will, the file into chunks, it still doesn't mean that we're ready to port them off into the final storage destination because we still have to be sensitive again to are we running off battery, are we plugged in, do we have Wi-Fi, what have you. So in other words, we may want to wait an additional longer period of time. I hopefully, maybe some point in the next, let's say 12 hours, the user might plug in his or her phone. So if we can hold off a little bit, that's when the actual porting off will happen. If the user's phone is plugged in and you've got Wi-Fi connectivity, well, we might as well schlep it off as soon as the initial one-hour delay is done. Question. Can somebody give me a short erasure of codes to tell you how much of what that is for? Oh. I am by no means an expert, but basically it is French for, let's say we have a file and we break it, okay, um, let's talk about 8.5 erasure coding, okay? There's a, there's a bunch of different flavors on this. But in effect, what we're going to do is chunk this file up into eight pieces, and any five of them arbitrarily can be used to reconstitute the file on this. General K out of N thing that, that we were discussing. Okay. So any five of eight, what have I Okay. Right now, again, we're not going to divide it into such fine granularity, but again, hopefully, I think it's a reasonable assumption that people's number of gizmos that they have, be it, if you will, laptops, uh, mobile devices, are going to grow. And it may very well be a reasonable assumption in 10, 15 years that people have 20 devices among which you can distribute these pieces. Who knows? Anyway. This is what's going on here. So again, to recap, initial delay just to make sure that people are done editing files, and then perhaps a longer delay if the phone is not plugged in or we have bad connectivity. Eventually, we may have to resort to hammering the user's 3G connection if we need to, just because we have to back up the, some, the file at some point. We don't want to kind of let it go on forever. What is that eventually? Is it 24 hours? That is actually configurable, hence the fudge factor in here. In other words, mm -hmm. right now we're cheating a little bit. We're saying user configurable on that, and perhaps there should always be a user menu on this, but it probably would be good long run uh, if we can kind of highly suggest to the user based upon, again, research and studies, what that optimum point should be. And again, that is a subject for quote unquote future research question. So when, when you split a file like this and distribute it to multiple chunks, do you have any strategy to uh, where the primary chunks go and where the secondary chunks go? Okay. First off, these are all pure chunks, but as right. far as like where they actually get distributed, yes. I mean, the quick version is obviously you don't want to put all the chunks on one device. That kind of defeats the whole purpose of that. Okay. Uh, and obviously, the other thing too is if the more devices in the long run, obviously, you can perhaps distribute chunk A to two different devices for kind of an additional level of redundancy on top of that, belts and suspenders, if you will. 
No, I, I meant, uh, so this will give you a few primary chunks and a few secondary chunks, right? No, so there's no, there's no distinguish, distinction between primary chunks. You get eight chunks no, and use any file. Out of, any k out of n chunks. No, but if, if you are reading the primary chunks itself, you don't really have to undergo the reconstruction process. There's no primary chunks. You mean the original file, perhaps? Yes, suppose the original file uh, is broken to five parts. So those five parts, my understanding is those five parts will constitute the primary chunk, and you expand the five parts to eight parts, and the extra three parts will be the second three chunks. No, 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 no. Think of error correcting codes, right? So you have oh. an extra bit for, for the whole packet to yeah. now be able to re recreate one bit. Yeah, so you, if you have the original packet, this is how it's done. It's, you are, it's not divide the file into five chunks, and then create a sphere additional. You add the redundancy first to the file. And then the entire thing gets divided into eight chunks. Well, to me, I'm not sure uh, what Gav is yes. using, but this so is one way of doing it. This is called yeah, systematic so this code. Is, it depends on the code. This is called systematic code. Well, you just use the original chunks, thing. and then you okay. create a few addition. In, in that case, okay. that is correct. Okay. I don't know what these guys are using. Okay. Uh, but it depends, it depends on the general case. Generally, original coding. I mean, you don't want it to distinguish primary versus well, secondary. RS coding works that way. Okay. Yeah. The advantage is uh, if you are expecting five devices to have high high availability, you put primary chunks there, so you don't need to really reconstruct the data. Okay. Unless it goes down, only then you'll take the overhead. Whereas yeah, this in is this one case, class of every read will take system an system overhead. System. One thing, actually, let me jump in here for just a minute, because you're actually raising a good point indirectly to something else I'm about to lead to, which is the number of chunks for a different reason, and that is, if you will, the size of the user storage. Let me get ahead of myself for just a second here. Uh, let's just for simplicity's sake that we simply use rate one mirroring, okay? Just two duplicate copies of every file, right? So it certainly does provide redundancy. It's not very efficient, obviously, on this. Um, remember earlier my premise that users typically have lots of extra storage at home, you know, maybe a two terabyte hard drive on their desktop, most of which is unused or what have you. They might also have two or three other devices that do not have quite as much storage. In other words, what we're getting into is an asymmetry in the amount of storage involved. So in other words, let's say this is the two terabyte hard drive, and let's say the user has two other devices that let's say are 500 gigs and maybe 400 gigs on here. Well, in one sense, the problem with this is that we have to be careful about how much, if you will, level of redundancy we're actually getting into. In other words, if we want to simply distribute the same number of, let's say, maximize the number of chunks to be the number of devices, in effect what we're going to be doing is capping things at the least common denominator here. Okay, what I'm saying is if, let's say, we go with something, let's say, only two pieces, well, what I can do is, let's say, one piece here, one piece here, one piece here, one piece here. In other words, put twice as many chunks on the biggest piece of storage. It doesn't provide as much redundancy, but what it does do is it kind of sops up a lot of this extra speed. Again, that's a design trade-off, and that's definitely where we're going right now with this paper. Okay, answer your question. Okay. Um, so basically, again, what we're talking about is we have to wait to make sure that the file gets done, then uh, gets done editing, then we may have to wait again to make sure that we have optimal network levels to kind of actually port the data off to our storage cloud. Eventually, we may not have optimal network levels, and we may have to simply deal with it and hammer the user's 3G connection on this. Let's actually talk a little bit about, okay, we were talking earlier about this, we've already gone over this, but, okay, chunks distributed, like I was saying, Basically, what we're trying to do is maximize the storage that the, if you will, the, store, the user actually has. Okay? And this does come at the trade-off of, if you will, not having the most expansive level of file redundancy that's possible on this. Oh, and I mentioned this earlier, again, the ultimate cache, which is leaving copies on the user's mobile device as long as we possibly can. Now, eventually, we're going to have to zap it off the user's mobile device but we make the assumption that at least initially a user takes a picture, there's a good chance that the user will look at it and access and twiddle around with it at some point in the not too distant future. Sharing. Up until now we've been talking about redundancy, in other words, how can we furnish, if you will, a fail safe if, let's say, 
uh, the file gets deleted accidentally, or let's say a device simply goes bad. What about another issue? We haven't talked about this until now. Remember when we had the graphical diagram earlier and I said kind of forget mobile user number two that was in the top right hand corner? Well, let's kind of reinstantiate mobile user two back into an existence here. What we can do is also, to a limited extent, use Pocket Locker as a peer file sharing mechanism. In other words, how can we actually, user A decides to share this photograph with user B? Well, there's two ways that this sharing can happen. And we like to talk about it as being explicit and implicit sharing. Quick version is, when we're talking about implicit sharing, we're simply dropping a file into a shared folder. And honestly, all we're really doing there is we're simply going to use the same strategy that we used for backup. In other words, if this show folder is designated to be accessed by user A and user B, well, you know what? We're not going to make the assumption that user B immediately wants it. We're going to say that at some point user B might want it. So we're going to wait for an hour and then maybe even wait longer until the phone is plugged in. But eventually it'll get into the storage cloud so that user B can pull it off of the distributed storage cloud. Let's contrast that with explicit sharing, okay? This is the situation for, I'm talking to you, I just took your picture, and now I want to send you the picture, or something like that. So I want to explicitly share that picture with you. The assumption here is that, you know what, user B is probably going to want that file very soon. So how can we actually make that happen? We go right ahead and we push it immediately, okay? Um, even if that means hammering a 3G connection on this. At least we push it to the personal storage cloud, and then at that point, okay, we wait until the user retrieves it. And the user could retrieve it from the storage cloud immediately, or maybe at that point, maybe, okay, it's there if the second user wants it. So not a primary focus of this paper, but it does have kind of a secondary implication that we can use, if you will, Pocket Locker for kind of enabling or furnishing these uh, capabilities to file sharing too. I'm sorry, sharing amongst users. Excuse me. What, yes. What's the difference between this and Dropbox again? Uh, I'm sorry. Between Pocket Locker and Dropbox? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I, I, I guess the big argument is that using Pocket Locker, you're using your own cloud. In Dropbox, you're in public cloud. You don't trust the public cloud, so you set up your own cloud. Is that right? Well, actually, yes and no. Okay, because as was mentioned earlier, to a certain extent, we are already using Dropbox as one part of our system. So I guess we have to trust the public cloud. Uh, the big thing is that uh, what we- wanted just to add, uh, even there, you don't have to trust it because you can encrypt the whole, whole thing. Correct. And you actually- You just as a proxy, right? I, I neglected to mention this earlier. Like one quick way uh, that is being tossed around right now is in terms of the number of chunks that's left in Dropbox, just make sure that there's less than K chunks so that- yeah, that's, that's also possible. Yeah, yes. you, don't, you don't have to trust Dropbox. Sure. Well, although I, I guess in one sense, if we're using it, we're trusting it to a certain level. Um, right, it depends but, on the definition of trust. Right. But right. in the traditional sense of definition of trust, you don't have to trust Dropbox. Correct. Correct. So, but I mean, I, I'd say like, Jayhan, to answer your question in terms of like, what, what does this add in terms of that Dropbox does not have? Okay, number one, much greater storage, at least for the price. Okay, and number two, we're going to, because of that, we're kind of building in a level of redundancy because, yes, we can simply say, yeah, the user can store it on this two terabyte hard drive at home, but A, when is he going to get around to doing that? And B, when is he going to get around to backing up that two terabyte hard drive? Probably next to never. Yeah, I raised the question because it seems most of the problem are already solved by it. Or Dropbox need to also solve this problem, like how to distribute the chunks between internal the Dropbox oh, yeah. and the no doubt about that. I mean, as a matter of fact, I have no doubt. I mean, certainly you look at pictures of, uh, if you will. Dropbox just replicate stuff. Like, why, why are they worrying about how much portion I, I mean, store? In the data center, the job was store the whole file in one place. Oh, you're thinking of behind. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from RAID, it's all in the same space, right? That's yeah. not the same problem at all. But actually, I was going to raise a similar question. Oh, oh I think that is valid. Um, so, this. I think um, I think you guys probably want to. This is like the like feedback for the whole project. I think you guys probably want to spend a lot of time 
thinking about how you want to distinguish yourself from other things. Oh, so that's true. There is so too many file sharing, erasure coding, backing up, file back, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There is just too many. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first impression that anyone gets when you when you talk about erasure coding or file backing or peer-to-peer -peer stories or whatever is, you know, they didn't seen it for too long. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like 20 years of research or something. Or, yeah, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I don't know. So it's too, it's, it, it sounds all too familiar. That's the, that's the problem. So you, you might want to actually think hard about how you want to distinguish yourself from other work, other previous work, which is actually a lot. Like there's really large body of research that's been done so mm -hmm. far. Yes. So along with redundancy, I feel like convenience. Like, I would like my pictures to be backed up on my home storage. And at some level, it's not just a backup, but I will probably use it. Like, I want to show it, I don't know, to family members, and I'd like it to be there seamlessly instead of me having to go now share it with somebody or upload it to Facebook or do, I mean, so do any of the many things. Uh, and. There are other things you can do, right? So have these digital portal things where, and it can now pull from the local sto storage at home, and now it, that's updated with the latest photos. There is, there, there's more, uh, there's more of an, there's more than just redundancy, which I think you want to make, which is the point you want to make. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, you're right. I mean, the, the thing is, the at base, of course, the whole concept of network storage is very old, decades old. What we're trying to do is, if you will, expand the whole concept to take advantage of additional storage. And you're right, I mean, that's a new angle I had not thought about, too, and certainly convenience at home, too. So I, the other problem, too, is this is certainly not novel, but the problem of home networks not being backed up. I would add office networks not being backed up, too. So to the extent that maybe this is an additional kick in the pants, because users typically are going to be more concerned about access rather than backing up until they actually need it. So this could, okay, with A, you get B, too. But yes, you're quite right. We have to make those distinctions. Yes. So I mean, okay. so to be a little bit more constructive, not just negative. No, no. Um, I would say, architecturally, it might be difficult to distinguish yourself. Mm -hmm. But if, you're talk if you start talking about more, more on the policy, yes. <laughs> then you might be able to actually distinguish yourself, because you're operating in a very different environment now. Um, you know, move on. I'm sorry, what? Mobile phones. Okay, yes. You're operating in a very different environment. Now you're, you have to rely on 3G, you know, limited connection, limited connectivity. Um, so when it comes to policies of when to back up, how to back up, you know, what rate I want to back up, you know, if you do a lot of experiments and show that okay, this is the ideal, you know, parameter that we can, parameter values that we can choose, then it might be actually, you know, it might be a valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Architecturally, I don't quite see, you know, there's a lot of difference. I mean, you can do cloud, you can you can do without cloud, you know, you can use home network, you, can, you don't have to use home network, you know, these are all kind of similar. Well, it's flat storage, you're exactly right. Yeah, so architecturally, it might be a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. So Steve, hasn't a lot of this work been in the space of like data center storage? No, I mean, there's a lot here, here too. I mean, no, but I think the I mean the, the key work that you mentioned. I mean, people have applied in mobile networks. Yeah, well, mobile networks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty much the same thing. You have right. laptops instead of smartphones, right? But it's pretty much no, but same. then the trade-offs are somewhat different. I think that's where so, so the that, there the pol thing. policy questions come right. into play. I yeah. think. And I I'm sort of as, not as negative as you. I think there's there's value in both utility and this policy. Sort of saying hey, you're looking at it in a different setup. Uh, and I think there, obviously, you want to do things differently that significantly affect the way you do things. And so you want to rebuild a system that does it together. Mm -hmm. um, I want to sort of add to that. Um, you know, if you compare, let's say, a Dropbox client or mobile phone, right, then I, I believe this, you know, pocket locker client that they are trying to develop does offer even architecturally, you know, difference in the sense that the Dropbox client that you install on your mobile phone only allows you to sync with the Dropbox, you know, this cloud. Whereas here, you know, this, this 
plugin lock find can allow you to talk to the Dropbox folder if you wanted to, and also the one at a, at a home. Uh, but, right? but what if you set up a Dropbox in your home computer and it, you turn it on all day, then it's going to be synced to the, the, your home computer. But it's still, it's still different. See, I, I don't see it. So well, no, but Dropbox is not intelligent. Like this is the <laughs> Dropbox just copies right. things, right? So this is like GHP. So like Steve was saying, there are things that have been done in sort of the peer-to-peer -peer setting yeah. with a sort of a similar yeah. flavor. But this has more intelligence in that Dropbox just copies things. It's not, it's not doing anything more intelligent. Yeah, all right. in so so that that goes back to the policy issue. I agree. Right. Yeah. There is actually I don't know if you guys use it. I used it a couple, of, I guess a year ago, and I stopped using it because of the speed is too slow. Anybody heard of Pogo Plug? The, Look it up. Yeah, Pogo yeah, Plug. The thing that Pogo, Pogo Plug Pogo. allows you to do, I think, what you wanted to do. The Pogo Plug gets very close to what you want. I mean, you can have a have a client on your mobile phone, right? They have their own cloud. It also allows you to install that Pogo Plug at, uh, on your on your home computer, you know, associated with. I mean, it just needs to be a USB capable you know, Pogo plug thing, and then you plug your external device, hard, hard disk, to it, and, and it can serve as a, a storage. What do you want to call it? Personal, personal storage. storage yeah. And it does this automatic, you know, backup between the Pogo plug cloud, the, the home storage, so that functionally wise, it gets very close. But, but even that, I, I think that Steve's argument is that, you know, the policy, when do you back up, you know, all these, considering the Wi-Fi versus uh, 3G, you know, that definitely has a lot of, you know, interesting, uh, you know, things to do. Oh, definitely. Like, you definitely, should look at the like, Pogo plug, how Pogo plug Pogo plug, plug. okay. That's, I don't know, definitely. Uh, let me definitely say that this system is not intended to be like a synchronous mimic of drop plugs, okay? In other words, it is intended from square one to be asynchronous in terms of when things are backed up and again considering some. So maybe that might partially address what your concerns are in terms of it's not meant to be a carbon copy of simply network storage in the abstract. Yes? So uh, in, in terms of what the things you're doing when you store a file, you are splitting and spreading across multiple uh, units. So are you positioning this for files which are read-only? Like because I see for editable files, it's really hard to do this. So I assume media files are non-editable, so are you just... We actually are making the assumption that media files will be editable on this. And you're right, I mean, it, editing does throw in another hornet's nest, but it's something that we have to deal with. And the direction we're going in right now is, obviously, if you've got a local, we certainly would not want to edit across the network into someone's, if you will, home computer on this. But let's say that a file was produced and stored, and this was two weeks ago, it's been expunged from the local's mobile device, and now the user wants to go back and edit that file, you're going to have to retrieve that file, and again, now you can start to edit it, and again, the old limitations apply. In other words, we want to wait till the user's activity simmers down, and then eventually port it back out. So you're right, and it's not meant to be, like, again, another distinction I would say with, let's say, um, a client like Dropbox or let's say Google Drive where you can actually do it in real-time editing. I mean, in that sense, to the extent that there's actual real-time access, that's going to be done on the user's mobile device. No, Carl, I think this is a good point in that you want to discuss a little more to sort of distinguish yourself because the trade-offs when you have worked with editable files are much worse for doing it on a phone versus, I don't know, Dropbox and multiple laptops and desktops where my Wi-Fi connection is great in my and I don't have those limitations. Might be something you want to bring up to the group and sort of think That's a little true. more about how you can look at the changes in individual chunks or now do something Git-like, I don't know. I have it's something that does more intelligent things than... I, I confess I do not know if this has been discussed, the issue of, let's say, you are plugged in, you have Wi-Fi connectivity, and your desktop is, let's say, sitting right next to you or something like that then, okay, maybe we need to think about that as a design decision, build in enough smartness. Hey, we can do, although you know what, even then, it's, if it's plugged in, you know what, it might still be better just schlep the file to the mobile device because editing itself tends to be so intensive and then schlep it back. I don't know, I mean, but you're right, we have to run some studies. 
as opposed, I guess the most extreme example is, let's say, uh, you want to edit a file that is, again, on your work computer that you can't even get to for, let's say, a few hours, and when you want to finish editing it, it's going to take a while for, let's say, the chunks to be distributed back. But you're right. Like, connectivity needs to be considered. So, I mean, w once again, I think I might have read too many stories. <laughs> okay. I need to hear this. So, I, I would suggest uh, you to go to this conference called FAST. I don't know if you have Fast. read any paper yeah, from FAST. Right. FAST is a file and storage system conference. Okay. Uh, Unix FAST that you can go there. Okay. Just look up every year what papers there are. Okay. And you'll be able to see you know, what things that I'm talking about. Okay. Pretty much all the discussions that I've, that I've heard here within an hour, there's a, there's a set of papers mm -hmm. pretty much on every topic. Mm -hmm. I think still, if, you're, if you start talking about policies, then you don't have to worry about those questions at all. Because mm -hmm. now you don't have to make any difference from your architecture and your implementation from other implementation and other architecture. You don't have to worry about that at all once you talk, start talking about policy. So emphasize the policy on this. Yeah. Okay. So what's the right set of parameters to consider, and what are the right values for those parameters in the given setting? As opposed to just the architecture in the abstract. Right, okay. right. And the features, too. There's so many features. I mean, storage industry is so rich, right? So you don't have to worry about the features, architectures, anything like that once you start talking about policy. Okay. And I think that's a, a lot better place to be in, I think. Mm -hmm. so, you're sending to a mobile systems venue, then likely anyway that's of interest. Right. I think. Right. No, thank right. you. Appreciate that. So. Right. So fast. Go go to that conference. Just okay. look at Do it as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. We talked about creating files. Let's finally talk about deep sixing them. Okay. It does eventually happen. Okay. And let me say this. Jeff is very, very insistent on this. Let's not bother actually really deleting the files. I'm going to use the word erasing until we absolutely have it. Think about it. Why do you have to zap the file? Just because a user says, I want to delete it. Just mark it as, OK, the file is still there, or should I say the chunk is still there, but we can reclaim it, if you will, later on. Okay. It's going to, if you will, give us lots of, if you will, prizes in the Cracker Jack, one of which is we can have undeletion. Okay, a user, let's say five minutes later, says, you know what, I made a mistake. Well, okay, we just mark the erased file, I'm sorry, the deleted file as being undeleted, and there we are. Now, in terms of policies, okay, uh, the server actually is charged with implementing, if you will, what is the order of when these chunks actually really get erased on this. And, well, that consists of two parts, kind of thinking ahead to when we will erase the parts, and then actually the implementation is going to be implement, well, implemented by, if you will, the storage cloud, I said the storage lockers, in other words, the user's desktop PC, what have you. Now, kind of two ways of looking at this. What happens if a user zaps something from phone itself? Or let's say, you know what, better yet, a user takes a picture, okay? And at this point, if you will, the amount of storage on the user's local file system is butting right up against full. Okay, what can we do at this point? Well, Pocket Locker makes sure that there's about a 25% of the storage space can be purged immediately because it's already for sure backed up somewhere on the cloud. So in other words, let's say that the local file storage that is visible through Pocket Locker is, okay, uh, how can I say this here? If you will. Um, it's unbeknownst to the user, it's full of files, but the user has already, if you will, um, if, well, actually, let's take that, let me back off a little step here. Um, basically, uh, if the, the, the file system is full and the user decides to, uh, if you will, delete a file, um, that can happen right away because 25% of those files are already stored on the cloud and can be removed immediately on this. Now, if the user wants to go further beyond that 25%, what we're going to have to now do is start moving the files from the user's local storage off to the storage cloud. Okay? 
eventually what happens if we run into a problem with the storage cloud itself filling up? At that point, which chunks actually get erased? Okay, you might as well go toward the old rule from operating systems. If you will most recently used, we want to kind of hang on to the longest time. So, even, yes? I think there's not much new here. So right. I, I, don't, I don't think you need to spend that much time, right? But yeah, I mean, the point is that we're doing that since yeah, 30 I mean, years. I mean, even, you know, you know, trash is some similar ideas. So, so don't, don't need to emphasize. This should not be an emphasis. Okay. Okay. Uh, how many more slides do you have? The reason I asked is not only I have to go, but, and I, I would like to basically you know, encourage the faculties here, especially the students, to, to uh, attend a talk at the 1.30 downstairs. Yep, basically two files. In other words, limitations, and this is actually already <coughs> kind of been mostly covered here, if you will. When you create content, okay, we're not guaranteeing that it's going to be backed up immediately due to concerns about, if you will, cost and network connectivity. And similarly, in terms of retrieving a file, that's not necessarily going to happen because I mean, it might not happen instantaneously because the file might have already been ported off to the storage cloud at an earlier date, and let's say one of the computers is actually currently off. And we might have to wait until the user goes into work or what have you. So again, the purpose of storage, uh, it's pocket locker, is not meant to be a 24-7, always on, enterprise grade storage, rather it is intended to kind of get halfway between that on the one end and what we typically have at home, which is a whole bunch of voluminous storage that is not always on and not always very reliable. So we're trying to position ourselves right in the middle. Question? So two slides ago you said the server makes the policy, I don't like that. The server decides what to it is. What, what is the concern with that? I mean, you started off saying the server is only there for me to make this connection, and now the server is doing more decisions with the server. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it, my, my bad then, because I thought I made it clear that the server does make these design decisions. In other words, the server coordinates which junks, chunks get sent where and in what order they should actually be erased. In other words, it's kind of the brains behind the operation. What it does not do is the server does not furnish any storage for data. So I'm sorry. And, oh, Coda. Basically, smartphones are great. They have a lot of features. They also have some downsides. We already talked about that. Mainly, they are small in size, and they're not always all that well backed up. And we need to address that. You're not referring to the Coda file system. I was thinking that too. I'm sorry. Because that <laughs> does the same thing. Oh. It's pretty much the same thing. It's pretty much the same yeah. thing, actually. And that's 20 years Like so. AFS and Coda do exactly the same thing, which is. Pun yeah. not intended. Uh, yeah, okay. So you should look up Coda as well. So, because the Coda file system does, like, the disconnected operation basically supports disconnected operation. Fair enough on that. Questions, comments? Thank you. Appreciate your time. Very Thank good. you for the feedback. Very good. Very good. Very good. No, I'm serious. No, I need to put your ear up.